workshop is actually part of a project um, that I managed for uh, pro-literacy that was funded by the Dollar General uh, Literacy Foundation. And I am um, pro-literacy Southwest regional representative. Pro-literacy, if you're um, not familiar with it, is a, an international organization that supports um, state level and local level uh, literacy and adult basic education programs um, in uh, all 50 states and in 50 developing countries around the world. And so um, pro-literacy and Dollar General um, have been interested in um, uh, referral systems for a long time now. Dollar General um, is a retail chain and we don't have them here in California, but they're moving west. They're in Colorado and, and New Mexico, so who knows um, if we'll get them. But in uh, any Dollar General store that you walk into, on the checkout counters, there are referral cards. So prospective students and tutors can fill out those cards, send them into pro-literacy, and, um, and then they'll be sent um, information about a local program in their area that they can contact. So as Pro-Literacy and Dollar General were sort of monitoring this referral system, they realized that over a five-year period that only about 8% of students who expressed an interest in literacy programs actually enrolled in programs and began receiving instruction. That's a huge gap, so they wanted to, to do something about that. Um, they started collecting data from other referral systems, hotlines and um, coalitions that provide referral services in communities. Um, at the local, national, and state level, and they found that there was pretty much a range between 5% and 30%. 30 only, the only um, one being 30% was at Walmart, and they had some very intensive um, support for that. So really, um, again, all of these folks that say, yes, I want to go into instruction are not getting services. So we wanted to take a look at, at that. So Pro-Literacy worked with um, nine different programs in eight states that were affiliated with the American Library Association, the Commission on Adult Basic Education, or COABE, and Literacy USA. And we tracked them, and we documented what it was that they did um, in programs in their area, areas. When they were, got a referral, what did they do internally as organizations? How did they handle that? And then what did they do between agencies within their community to make uh, services seamless. And so we um, did a project, and this workshop is part of that dissemination piece of the project. So we've been going around um, to different conferences across the country and telling folks and inviting them to really reflect on their own referral systems. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. How do we actually get those folks who want instruction enrolled? What are some strategies that we can do to, to help increase that? So, um, if you look in your packets, on the left-hand side, the first page is an agenda. Do you need a packet? There you go. Thanks. Okay. And so on the first page of your agenda, you'll see the workshop objectives. So by the end of the workshop, you will have reflected on the frequent disconnect between student referrals and enrollments and programs, and the ways increased communication and cooperation among local service providers can bridge this gap. We will have examined field-tested strategies from across the country for how to improve your referral networks and systems and to increase the percentage of referred students who enroll in programs. And we will have identified some next steps that you might take for improving your own program's referral strategies and your community's referral systems and networks and uh, increasing the number of students who enroll in programs. So that's what we're here to do today. So the first step is to talk about where do you get your referrals in your programs? What are the sources of your referrals in your own communities? Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Yeah, that is probably the big one, the biggest one that everybody says. Social services. Social, Social. services. Great. Community service announcements. Okay. Word of mouth, social services, community service announcements. What else? We have a co countywide uh, coalition of literacy programs and um, the student 
called the, that council and then they're referred to programs. Terrific. So a community-wide um, literacy the council. Coalition. Is there an 800 number that's yes, associated there, with that? Hotline. Okay, terrific. How many of you in your communities have either a coalition or a network that whose function it is to sort of centralize services and distribute information? Okay. That is a really good strategy for, for increasing enrollment. So good for you. Where, where do you live? San Diego, and it's, uh, it was brought together by our newspaper. Terrific. Good. Okay. So, and it, I love that it's countywide. That's wonderful. So countywide coalition. What are some other referral sources? Well, I don't know if this goes on the word of mouth or not, but really personal referrals where somebody's bringing in a family member or trains as a tutor so they can work with a family member or a friend. Great. Yeah, you know, our students and our tutors and our instructors are certainly our, our best advertisements here. So um, personal referral. Yeah, we send our students to job fairs and, and community fairs and they set up tables. And Perfect. Fairs. Job fairs, I like that. And you send your students out yes. and so they're the ones who are actually connecting with other prospective students. And we'll talk about that later. That was a huge key. Any strategy that the programs that we worked with that actually had students contacting other prospective students, much more successful than, than just us out there. So, okay, so job fairs. Anything else? Drop-in day for dropouts was valuable for us, the nationwide drop-in day for dropouts. We use oh. that as a recruitment. Can you talk a little more about it? nationwide drop-in day for dropouts? Right. I'm not familiar with that. Could you, could you, is it, in, does everybody else know what that is? Am I the only one in the room who doesn't know what that is? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, it's an effort to recruit uh, individuals K through 12 who have dropped out of school mm -hmm. to recruit them to come back to adult education. Terrific. Great, and where if somebody wanted to know more about that, where would they get information? There's a website, uh, I can't, can anyone speak I to it? I can't remember. Well, I've gotten stuff from CCAE on it, I think. Yes. So that's probably why we're familiar with I bet if you Google it, probably, it'll come up. So thank you, that's a new one. You win a prize if I had it. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Okay, anything else? Yes. We have quarterly bring a friend to class. Oh, I like that. So again, it's that personal touch. It really is. And what a wonderful thing, right? Because it takes a, a lot of that scariness away. So wow, did you say quarterly? Quarterly bring a friend. That's great. OK. <laughs> And just to share something that happened on our last one, a student brought her mother to the class and we put her in a, a little con, kind of um, individualized learning plan for that day. And it's now a month later and her daughter is now enrolled and her mother. Oh, so they're all in the same class. Oh, that's really neat. And Mother's Day's coming up, so that's a heartwarming Mother's Day story. <laughs> Excellent. Wow, I really like that. You know, I've heard husbands and wives and yeah, other family members. So that's great because, you know, as we know, studies have shown that another a key thing in, in really keeping um, students in programs and, and increasing persistence is having that support network, whether it comes from the program or from the family or somewhere. So that's great. So um, good. Yes. Um, we canvas um, uh, certain zip codes and have flyers in our local newspaper. It isn't very personal, but we're doing much more of that, in including you know, the ethnic fairs like the Cinco de Mayo, Dia de los Muertos, oh, the Chinatown fairs, and we actually have a physical presence, you know. But we have students there when we have students. So ethnic fairs, and then you said newspapers, newspaper ads, or in flyers. Oh, flyers. 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 flyers, in streets, streets, you know, strategically throughout the year. Terrific, okay, good. Do any of you get referrals from other adult basic education and literacy programs within your community? Yes. So if, if you've been, somebody's come to you but you're not really the right fit for them, okay, so yes, so other, A, B, E, and literacy programs. Okay, now 
I'm wondering how many of you actually track your, ref your enrollment rates for these different sources? Does anybody track? This is the exact response that we've had across the country. <laughs> so if there is one thing that you get out of this workshop today, I will actually be really happy because I, I'm just encouraging you and challenging you to actually go back to your programs and see the link or the disconnect between a referral source and an enrollment rate. Because if you actually you know, put some effort into that and say, huh, let's think about this, let's track that for a while, um, I think that you'll find, you know, where are we, you know, where do we maybe have some work to do? You know, how can we get out and maybe work with some folks where our, our enrollment rate is really not as, as good as we would want it to be? Or, wow, you know, which ones are working for us and, and, you know, can we enhance that in any way? So, you know what, let's just guess. I know that you don't actually know the enrollment rates, but let's just, do, do you have a sort of idea, sort of inkling? of where, what your enrollment mates, rates might be for each referral source? Or is it just a complete mystery? Usually people can kind of guess. I'd say 10%. Word of mouth? Um, yeah. Okay, 10%, okay. What about from social service agencies? Depends on your Cal work oh. program, I guess, how large that is. But I mean, our social services. Ours is pretty high because they're required to come. So yeah. if I'm getting a uh, referral from social services, I'd say it's like 90%. Whoa. Like, you know, they lose their money if they don't come. Okay, yeah. okay. So that sometimes if they're mandated, if yeah. a student is mandated yeah. by a social service, that's a pretty big incentive. Yeah. And so that referral rate may be higher. What are some other things that um, a social service, uh, that a relationship with a social service organization um, may affect enrollment rates? Even if you're not mandated, uh, if a student's not ma mandated to come. It seems as though if there's a personal connection between um, the staff at a social service agency and a, uh, an adult basic education and literacy program, if you can say, you know what, my very good friend presenter here is, uh, your name tag only says <laughs> <laughs> presenter, so, uh, <laughs> um, you're actually Tom. Yes. So if you could, you know, if I am at a social service agency and I have a client, you know, rather than just say, you know what, across town there's this adult education program, if I can say, you know, there is this wonderfully nice man named Tom, and he's at such and such school, and I know that he gives wonderful attention to his students, and I know that you're going to have a great, great experience once you go there the likelihood of that student then actually going and having a good experience has really increased. Mm -hmm. With that referral, we have a phone call while the student's in the office. You know, so-and-so needs to come to your program, what time, you know, so we're, before, it's not a cold, cold referral, I guess, when I, when I say the numbers are that high. Yeah, and so that's it. So you have the social sur service right. agent person actually calling you, right. maybe setting up an appointment, you know, sometimes putting the, the, per yeah, the yeah. student on the phone. Yeah. Anything that you can do is going to, to increase that enrollment rate. Okay. What about community service announcement? What would your guess be for enrollment rate? 2%. 2%. Okay. <laughs> Countywide coalition. What do you think? Because usually a lot sort of more intention, you know, goes into a coalition. Than but it's, it's up to the student to follow through. I would say maybe 30%. Okay, okay. But so that may be, uh, you know, a more, a more promising source. And how about personal referrals? So, and that's sort of, you know, maybe sort of linked to the, to bring a, bring a friend kind of things. Okay. And job fair? Maybe 10%. Maybe 10%. If you put it with, uh, and if you put it with the ethnic there. Okay. Kind of and now remember, kind of thing. you know, the average is, is 5 to 30, or I would, I would actually say more probably 5 to 10, so um, surprisingly low. Okay. Uh, drop in for drop out. My experience is very low. Very low. So you like one percent. Okay. Okay. 
So again, we're just guessing. I would really encourage you um, to, to go ahead and, and start tracking some of that. This today's workshop is just a little snippet to encourage you to go back to your programs and talk with your colleagues. If you really want to delve into this, we're actually developing an online course right now that's going to be housed on ProLiteracy's um, website, and it should be available um, this summer. And I don't have the web address for you right now, but if you email me, if you're interested, at catlit2003 at yahoo dot com when that's ready I can let you know um, and there are going to be some really wonderful resources there so it's going to um, uh, there's going to be a, a tracking form that you can use to help you track your your enrollment or uh, your referral sources um, all kinds of, of things okay so um, we talked a little bit about what are some things that um, that are positive factors in turning referrals into um, enrollments. We talked about that personal connection. <coughs> what are some other things, other positive factors that you think would help turn referrals into enrollments? Human <coughs> contact. You know, Follow up as, as quickly as you can, and more than once if necessary. Human contact, immediate follow up. How many of you have policies and procedures in place in your programs for what to do when you get a student referral? Do you actually have some stated, explicit, written down policies and procedures? Okay, do you say, you know what, every referral that we get, we will um, get back to them within 48 hours or 72 hours or, or um, a week even. That would be at, at the latest. What we're finding is that programs really don't have those sorts of things in place. And what we found when we talked to the programs that tracked their efforts to enhance their enrollments, um, that really quick follow-up and personal follow-up was, was really a, a, a big um, indicator for, um, or um, uh, a big influence on, on turning enrollments, uh, referrals into enrollments. What else might be a positive factor? Positive experience with the initial contact. Absolutely. <laughs> Boy, if they have a, a grumpy person on that first phone call, or if somebody isn't really, really welcoming, um, that first contact, that's where you get them or you'll lose them. Okay, so it's very important who is answering that phone or who is greeting people when they walk in the door has to be somebody who's, who's friendly. So friendly, warm, first contact. What else? Um. I was uh, dealing with ESL literacy mm -hmm. students, and we found, I guess this goes under immediate follow-up, we had to have no red tape, mm -hmm. um, and we had to immediately identify that it was a literacy person and not a person with who could go into like a beginning class. So immediate screening and elimination of red tape because if we put a, a literacy person in the orientation, we lost them. Uh, interesting. Okay, so for ESL students, no red tape. Had to be a seamless flow exactly. and immediate screening into the correct service. Right. If they got into the screening part with people with higher skills, they were intimidated and left. Okay, so they need to be sure that this is the right program for them and that they, they feel comfortable and right. so that's which, great. Which all involves just training staff, the sensitivity to staff at different things. Yeah, training is a huge issue. How many of you actually train your program staff or volunteers on how to handle referrals once they come into your program? You, yay, that's great. <laughs> I think, unfortunately, you're pretty atypical. Susan, do you? Yeah. Great, yeah. great, okay. <laughs> So again, you know, this, is, this workshop is all about encouraging you to actually think about this and maybe start some of these 
you know, pretty easy to implement um, strategies in your own programs. Anything else? Well, we don't ask the students to fill the forms out themselves. Um, and that's part of what she's talking about with the no red tape. We go over the form with them and, and fill it out because if you're dealing with a non <coughs> a non reading person, you hand them the form and they're gone. So. Great. So staff fills out forms. Again, that takes some of that scariness and that, you know, oh, let's show up your um, <laughs> your weaknesses on the very first encounter, right? So staff fills so out. And, and that goes back to that training because. You know, if you have a high school diploma student and you won't let them fill out the form, they're going to think you're a little odd. So you right. have to have that training so the person can can read the situation well. Okay, you need to gauge who who you're dealing with and and go from there. Okay, great. Now let's talk about barriers because there are just a bunch of barriers that keep folks from enrolling. Oh, you know what? We've we've missed a really critical thing. Um, this is sort of. Um, you know, talking about what's going on with the student and what's going on with the initial intake, but um, program capacity, right? Some folks just are not able to offer the services that um, a student, a prospective student, pr um, expresses interest in. They don't have; they may have a waiting list, or um, they don't um, offer um, classes or instruction or tutorials at the times and locations that are convenient, and so. It's sort of program capacity to offer services. And if you can't offer the services that the student asks for immediately, it's really important to be able to offer some alternate services as well, okay? And um, the other project that I, I managed for Pro Literacy was actually a, a nationwide um, program improvement project on um, reducing student waiting lists. We worked with seven model programs across the country, one in California from um, Alameda County, the library literacy program there, and um, we worked with 16 pilot programs and, um, on the um, Verizon Literacy Network uh, website. Uh, there is an online course about reducing student waiting lists, and on the Pro Literacy website, we have a wonderful promising uh, practices packet. So if any of you have difficulties with large student waiting lists, um, that's, that's another great resource, but really key to be able to offer those services when and where those students need them. So what are some barriers? What keeps students who have expressed interest from actually enrolling and getting instruction? Transportation. Transportation is huge. That's one of the big three. Transportation, child care. Child care, second of the big three. What else? Fear. Fear. Three of the three, yes. That's the, those are the big ones. Work schedules or work responsibilities. Okay, and we'll talk a little more about those in a minute. What are, what are some other barriers? Fear. Fear, huge. Okay. We talked about program capacity. What else? Family obligations. Family obligations. Yeah, not just childcare, but say that you're caring for an elderly parent, or say you know you have all kinds of, of things. So family responsibilities. Yep. What else? Okay. I would encourage you to, to go through this exercise with your, your colleagues in your programs because um, sometimes these things are, are sort of um, uh, individualized for a particular geographic area or what's going on in your community socioeconomically, um, culturally, that kind of thing. So this is a nice exercise to actually Again, to put some intent and some thought and reflection to say, what's going on in our community? What's going on in our program? What are some barriers? And then we'll talk about what can we do to overcome them. Dealing with a rural area, sometimes it's a, you don't ever have that anonymity. And so it's, mm. it, you know, it's an extra layer of getting the kind of staff in a situation where people will be okay with people knowing. And, you know, it's, we're supposed to be totally confidential, but you know the tutor talks about 
this this happened a couple of years ago. Tudor talks about the student that she's studying. Well, everybody else could figure out who the student <laughs> was because she she mentioned, oh, I have a student. Da -da -da -da, you know, and only said a couple sentences, but three other people said, oh, you're so good. <laughs> Ah, oh, that must yeah. be so and so because they know. Right, and small so. communities and rural right. communities, it's very hard. Everybody knows everybody else, and mm -hmm. so it's hard to keep your business private. Oh, yeah. So those are some particular challenges in, in that sort of community, and, and we can talk about are there ways that you can deal with that. Um, so again, you know, <laughs> if, if you can be as proactive as possible in your program to, to identify the barriers and the positive factors and then to work towards removing barriers and uh, working to enhance the positive factors, you are going to have more folks who actually enroll who have called to ask about your services. So let's actually just do some problem solving right now. Let's think about transportation, one of the, the biggest challenges for students to, to getting to instruction. What are some ways that you might be able to overcome that barrier? We plan with the city to locate one of our school sites next to a um, exchange. Area. Excellent, excellent. So locate instruction sites. near public transportation. And what we've um, found as we've worked uh, with programs across the country is it's not enough just to locate them where your students live. It's where they live, where they work, and where they visit. And so when you're um, doing intake with your students, be sure to ask those three questions, okay? Because you want to be sure that, that you're, um, you know, you're taking your services where, where the need is. Okay, so this is sort of, you know, go to the students, okay? Find out where your students are and take your services to them. That's a great one. What else? Encourage uh, students in a classroom to to become like to have a pair partner so that uh, they can call each other when they miss a day or, or and that's part of you know the classroom experience. Okay, that's great. You know what? Let's see. I would put let's put that let's park this down here. So sort of um, buddy system, buddy system for um, student support. Okay. That's a great one, so that people feel connected with each other. Good. And where I thought you were going with that is um, sure. ride sharing, <laughs> exactly, right, and carpooling. And so, um, you know, sometimes it just doesn't occur to students. They may actually live or work or, you know, come in the same area, but it just wouldn't occur to them to ask somebody for a ride. And so if a program can facilitate ride sharing, um, that's a great strategy. <coughs> What are some other transportation creative ideas? In an adult education for the homeless programs that I worked in in Berkeley, we had um, um, a, a somebody donate, pay for transportation vouchers. They bought, um, they had these one-time vouchers and we would give them out, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of class so people would come the next day. Ah, but clever. Yeah, you c I don't think most schools could buy them out of their funds, but it was a donation from um, a CBO, I believe, and then when that ran out, we got it from a private person. That's great. So yeah. donated transportation vouchers. I know some programs um, buy, you know, they've worked with their um, county or city transportation authorities, and they've been able to buy discounted bus tokens or, you know, public mm -hmm. transportation tokens. So anything that you can do to kind of either, you know, um, completely um, um, uh, get rid of or reduce transportation costs. That's a great thing. Good. Vary your instructional sites. Great. Can you say a little more about that? Well, um, vary your instructional vary sites. Vary your instructional yes. sites. So, and of course I'm thinking on terms of literacy to some extent, but 
you have different places where the students live, and if, for example, you can have an instructional site at their um, at uh, the apartment complex, mm -hmm. then they're within walking distance, and their kids could stay at home with the other spouse. Or um, if you have it at the library, if that's within walking distance, so you're looking where to have it where they are rather than where you are. Right. And so instead of expecting everybody to be able to come to you you go to them. That's, that is a hugely important strategy. And we worked with a program in Nashville, Tennessee, actually with a re reducing student waiting list. And what we found is there's so much crossover between reducing stu uh, student waiting lists and enrollment, right? Because you, you need to get those folks in there before it's too late. Um, a program in Memphis actually um, uh, has, looks at their waiting list, sees where the students are um, concentrated, and then they put a paid staff member and then volunteers in that area. And that area shifts, so they're never overextended. You know, once they take care of these folks, and then um, staff goes out, works with them initially, and then they match them with volunteers, and then they shift their resources to um, another site within their community. And they found that to be very, very successful um, in, in getting folks enrolled and engaged and keeping coming to, to class. What are some other other things. I think we've talked about, I think we've been good on the transportation. What about child care? Another huge barrier. What can you do? <coughs> There's enough spaces in on-site child care. So would, would your program Our offer? Our program has on-site on child care. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so yeah, so I mean the, the absolute Okay. The absolute ideal is if your program can actually offer on-site child care services, okay? Not that many programs can actually do that, but that is certainly something to strive for. So offer on-site child care, and what you're saying is that it's tough to get in. Yeah, I think it's funded by First Five or something. Okay. So to try to facilitate getting uh, the students actually in those spaces, right? Okay, facilitate placement. <coughs> Great. What may be the next best thing? If, you're, if your organization just can't do that, it's just it's not within your capacity right now, what might you be able to do <coughs> instead? I think you can schedule your classes morning, afternoon, and evening so that there is always the possibility that someone can take care of their child during that period of time they want to Great. come to a class. So um, offer instruction at varied times. So that the more classes you offer, the more potential there is for somebody being able to, to take care of a, 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 sub, a student's child. Good. What else? So working with, this is with on-site child care, working with Head Start, state preschools, those mm -hmm. kind of programs. Um, Great. So partner with another care. agency mm -hmm. that can. If you can't offer the child care on your, uh, in your program, then partner with somebody who can. You know, really build those partnerships. Excellent. Okay. And what if you really can't even do that? You just are so stretched to the limit, but you know they're out there. What refer? You can at least have a list of child care options, and you can at least be a source for that. So child care <laughs> referral. Okay. And we've had, you know, family. You were talking about family in the class. Sometimes you'll have mom come for a while, and then you know sister comes for a while, so that you know they're kind of sharing. It's not as as optimum because the adult doesn't get to class as often, but um, it's better than somebody staying home and not learning English. So maybe just some creative yeah, problem some creative solving, problem solving you know, about, you about child care. So um, talking that through yeah. with somebody to, so that, that they can realize what all their options are. Great. Or, or the students can almost form their own cooperative. Right. Facilitate. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's somebody's house or, or another facility. So yeah. facilitate um, shared child care. Great, you're sharing. And I know, oh, go ahead. I was going to say distance learning and independent study programs are really yeah. Absolutely. Distance learning and independent study programs. 
So you're helping the student, but they're able to actually stay in their home and take care of their family responsibilities at the same time as they're learning. Very good. The other thing is that some folks are able to offer um, instruction in child-friendly places like libraries or maybe faith-based organizations or community centers where, you know, as long as the, the child is sort of under control and not distracting from the instruction, um, that it's a safe environment um, for both the, the parent and the child. So child-friendly sites. Okay. What about work? <coughs> what can you do to help somebody get over those big work barriers? Sometimes if you're lucky, you can contract with businesses mm -hmm. bring classes Great, so contract with businesses to provide um, off-site workplace mm -hmm. literacy or workforce literacy. Right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's a great one. Okay, good, especially if you know that you have a concentration of students from a particular business, then that, that's a wonderful strategy. What else? During the schedule. Bearing this goes. So again, just like the child care, so flexible hours, so that no matter what uh, shift somebody's on, okay, and this can be really challenging when you've got folks who are working shifts that change every week, right? And so it's like, oh, well, I never know if I'm working daytime or nighttime or weekend or weekdays. So the more, you know, nighttime hours, the more weekend hours you have, the more flexibility um, that's going, uh, somebody's going to have. What else? But that also includes staff training because you have to make sure that people that are doing the registration process understand that it's okay to have a person registered for two weeks in the morning and then that they're going to come and be transferred into the evening program and that that's an mm -hmm. easy transition and that we're not always sending the student back to the office where you have to go back and fill out another registration <laughs> form in order to, you know, go to the evening. So it's, it's got to, again, have be that seamless process so that they can easily go back and forth and that the teachers are comfortable with it. Exactly. So that's it. It, it is a, a training issue mm -hmm. not only for registration staff but also right. for the teachers because they can be pretty disruptive to be having people come in and out. But again, you know, what's our goal? Our goal is to make it, it as easy as possible for somebody to actually right. enroll when they've said they want to come to class. Okay. Anything else? Well, I think a lot of the things from above, like distance learning, yeah. all work. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Childcare and transportation uh, and uh, and workplace are often, yeah. you know, those yeah. those are good. Excellent. Okay. Let me check in on our our time, and then if you look in your packet, um, on the left hand side, you will have a list of field tested strategies for turning referrals into enrollment. And these are um, strategies that were identified for, by the participants of the project that I've been talking about. So I'd like for you, gosh, maybe it's not easy to work in pairs if you guys are, are um, sort of separated by some seats. <coughs> if you can work in pairs, um, that's great. Um, I'd like for you to look over those strategies and just eyeball them. See how many of those strategies you, your program actually already has in place think if you don't have them in place, how many of them or which ones might work out for you? Do any look interesting to you? Do any look interesting but you think, mm, you know what, we, that would be kind of hard for us to implement? And if you think there are some that are appealing but look difficult to implement, just think about ways that you might overcome those implementation barriers. So if you can, it would be great to sort of talk um, with the folks around you and, and share your ideas about that. Take about uh, 10 minutes. So what were some things that struck you? Were there some strategies that you'd never thought of that you think that you might want to try in your program? Anything that, that struck you? Well, yeah. just from my experience with Department of Social Services reading through this, um, I think most of us have a tendency for we get the referral into the program and we depend upon the counselor and the student to take the next step. Mm -hmm. We don't see it that that's our responsibility because they, they're being referred by another agency. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's 
not part of, of what our thinking is. So do you think that you might go back and encourage your, your colleagues to rethink that? Um, or do you think that you know, that's just the way we operate and, and that's the way it has to be? Well, I think one of the things that we, we do is that if, the, if we get a referral from public social services and the person doesn't show up within that time frame, then whoever our person is in the adult ed office who called the counselor, mm -hmm. they wouldn't necessarily call the student. Okay. And th that's interesting. And again, w um, from our experience with this project, I would encourage you, if you were at all uh, able to do that, to actually connect with a student. Because again, any time the student has direct contact with your program that's friendly and encouraging and warm, they're, they're going to feel much more of a connection and they're going to be more likely to enroll. Sometimes there's just that much of a distance between a counselor or their social worker or caseworker or whatever. If there's a little link between you and that person, then it, it inhibits enrollment. So it, just to, something to think about in your program. Um, programs really found that you know if, if students didn't show up for their first appointment, if they called and said, "Hey, you missed your appointment. We we you know we were eager to see you. What happened?" Again, you know that's it, it's time intensive and staff intensive. It absolutely is. So that's something to think about in terms of program capacity. But it again, imagine the difference it makes to a student who's fearful, who's maybe had some negative experiences with education in their lives. Think about how much more. Um, reassuring and welcoming that that sort of environment is and, and that sort of system. Okay. And the one program that we worked with in New Orleans really, really struck us because we asked um, the nine programs and, and the, the programs in their community networks, um, you know, what, what their enrollment rates were and they were all really low except for a program in New Orleans. And the difference there was that the first person who contacted the student after uh, the program received the referral was another student. And it happened to be a student on staff that they employed just for this reason, but it could also be a, a student who's a volunteer, who just shows leadership qualities and, and that is very personable. But that student would call and say, hi, you know, this is Junius, and I understand that you're interested in our program. And I'm a student in the program, and let me tell you, it's great. And I know that it can be hard, and you have family, and you've got work, and all this stuff. But you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. And that seemed to make a huge difference. Their enrollment rates were so much higher than the other pro eight programs, and that was really the isolated, uh, the factor that we could isolate, um, that suggested um, that that was a key, key factor. Anything else that struck you, or anything you'd like to try? Sally. Um, I this one on. Um about the waiting list, the second one, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say um, um, a friend of mine, and actually someone you know too, Amy Crevidel, did her, a lot of people in literacy know her, did her master's degree on, um, at that time it was called retention, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and she found that this program she studied, that putting people in the computer lab while they were waiting to get matched with a tutor was a major factor in retention. So you said here, offer other services, and I just want to make a plug for a computer lab. And we, it was a drop-in computer lab, but there was always a volunteer there. And even if people were intimidated of computers, which is almost always the case I found with ABE students, but that computer lab became um, their introduction in a way, if they were on a waiting list, and we had trouble getting people out of the computer <laughs> lab and working with a tutor sometimes. They just, they bonded so much with the people in the lab or, and the experience of being on a computer, which they had never done before, many of them. So I just want to make a plug for that strategy because I know a lot of people may have waiting for it. Well, and, and I would yeah. second that. Um, again, there was so much crossover between the two projects and, and in the Reducing Student Waiting List um, project, many of the, the model and pilot programs that we worked with do, did use computer-assisted instruction and computer labs um, as, a, as a way to deal with waiting lists. Very, and it was very successful, <coughs> but only if there was staff support. If yeah. you just said, there's a computer, go have at it. No. 
Absolutely not. People yeah. are not going to come back. They have, to, even if they don't need the support person who's in the room, even, even if they never ask a question, just knowing somebody's there in case they need, they have a question, again, very reassuring. And it's a, it's a wonderful way to keep people engaged. Mm -hmm. And and once they're once they're even uh, you know matched in an instructional setting to to supplement um, their learning too. Good. Okay. Well, on the right hand side of your um, handout. There's a sheet entitled, My Plan for Improving My Program's Referral System. So if you have um, thought of at least one strategy that you would like to um, think about and perhaps implement in your program, I'd like you to write that down as a little uh, mind tickler. And I would encourage you to take this worksheet back and to um, talk about what you uh, we've discussed today with your colleagues and to think about, you know, are there some changes that we could possibly make with the way that we handle referrals in our program once we receive them. The other key thing that we found during this project was that it was how um, agencies within a community work together as well. So um, the biggest key factors, and you saw some of these in your strategy sheet on the, on the second page of your strategy sheet, is that if you are connected if your program is connected with other agencies in your community, if you know what services that they provide, if you know the schedule of their services, if you know the staff, and if you know them personally, better yet. How many of you in this room feel like you, you and your program and your colleagues have a really good um, sense of what's going on in your community in terms of other adult basic education and literacy services, and in, in terms of other human uh, and social service uh, agencies? Okay. I have to tell you, before I started managing this um, project, I was, I was pretty proud. I used to direct uh, the library literacy program in Santa Clara, and I was, you know, I was pretty connected. I thought I'd you know, done a really fabulous job of knowing what was going on in my community. Then I started working <laughs> with these other programs and seeing, uh, and I thought, oh gosh, I really did not do a very good job, and I had no idea that I wasn't doing a very good job. Um, I, I knew of some services, but I really didn't have a comprehensive understanding of what was available. Um, I, I didn't have contact um, information. I had let you know the, the flyers that I had collected sort of sporadically and put a little notebook. Um, I didn't update continually. Um, and so if somebody came to me, I could not immediately say, boy, you know what, we don't offer that, or, um, you know, I think there's another program that it could actually be better suited to your needs. It's closer to your house, or, you know, they have um, a schedule that would work better for you, or, you know, we don't offer the services that you need, but they do. And so this project really encouraged me to encourage you guys to really think and reflect on, do I know my community? Can I be more connected? Um, a lot of the... Um, the programs used um, referrals and enrollments as a topic to bring agencies together in their communities and say, can we do a better job? You know, we, we don't want um, it to be a mystery for prospective students in our communities to know, they, you know, I don't know how to get the services I, I want. We want to work together as a community to make it seamless, to make it transparent that one call gets you to the services that you need. And that requires working together and having a good understanding of your community. Um, and so, you know, one of the strategies listed is having a referral binder that you keep up to date. You know, having linking websites, um, just knowing. How many of you regularly meet? You may not have a formal coalition like the, the um, woman in the back, but how many of you meet informally or, you know, attend meetings where there are other, other organizations in your community? Okay, good. Where, what are those meetings? What, what, what's the venue, who's bringing, who's bringing you guys together? The Southeast Los Angeles County uh, Workforce <laughs> Investment Board has a uh, community collaborative network that they started a number of years ago <coughs> and we meet every other month. Great. And it's brought together all kinds of agencies and developed a uh, directory and we're one of the few groups that attend every meeting. Okay. But it's uh, brought us a lot of students from EDD and from the Workforce Investment Board. And Terrific. So it's been, it's been a good for us. recruitment <laughs> source for you and referral source for you. And do you, do those um, folks tend to enroll in your program? Oh, you absolutely. Ah, okay. So and we've developed a really great relationship with the counselors 
uh, years ago when they had a little more money, they weren't quite so interested in adult school. <laughs> and now that they don't have quite so much money, <laughs> they like us a lot. Yeah, <laughs> money's a powerful <laughs> incentive for cooperation, isn't it? <laughs> that, so Workforce Investment Board is a, is a great um, coalescing uh, factor. Great, okay. Where are other folks who have community meetings? Well, ours has that as well. We have the Workforce Investment Board that created what they call an Employment Connection Council. And so in our Employment Connection Council, we attend those meetings regularly, as well as all of the other uh, community-based organizations and city-based organizations, chambers of commerce, all that. And so we meet together regularly. In addition, we have, um, well, I'm from Porterville, and we have Porterville Partners meeting. And Porterville Partners brings together all the educational institutions, the CBOs, and other community you know, agencies that are involved to help people um, find jobs, get education, that kind of thing. That's great. So it sounds like employment is a catalyst and, and brings these folks together and then just a sort of coalition of nonprofits. And that's the thing that every community is different. So um, in some communities, it's only adult basic education and literacy providers. And, and sometimes there are multiple networks, right? So there's that network and then there are wider networks and it just, it's this ripple effect. Um, but again, you know, the wider you cast your net, the more services you can connect your students with. And as we've just talked about, you know, education, adult education is tied in with so many other things. So that if you can help um, your, your prospective students get all of the services that they need um, to encourage them to enroll in your, in your programs, it's going to, to be better. So um, that's great. And you know, if, if, you, um, if you don't have one of these um, community meetings, you, you, can, you can be the catalyst. You can be the one. You in, invite folks um, to, to come together with you. And you start a network or a coalition in your community. Sally. I have to do an advertisement for my employer. I'm with CalPro. Great. Uh -huh. And we, we, as you all know, probably, I hope, um, host networking meetings. So if your PDC, your Professional Development Center in your region doesn't have one and you're interested in starting one, please contact your PDC manager and say, I'd like to get a coalition of literacy providers going. And um, this has been one of our most successful growth areas in the last few years have been these networking meetings of different groups of coordinators and and so I'm sure that if there isn't one, there may already be one with your PDC, you may want to check. Boy, so there's help within the room uh -huh. yes. and at this conference. Well, there are, are four of you here from, from CalPRO? How many, five? All, the whole staff is here. Great, so yeah. so take advantage of this terrific resource. And I'm sure a lot of PDC managers are here um, too. Oh, great. And, yeah. and Vicki, does the Department of Ed, Vicki Prater is with the Department of Ed, does the department have anything that sort of um, would or do you rely on CalPro? We so rely on CalPro. Excellent. See, there's a partnership. Yep. That's what it's all about here. <laughs> okay. So good. Well, you know, again, um, there is a worksheet on your uh, in the right hand side, and that is uh, something that you could work on with your colleagues at your um, organization and in your communities, so that you can really take a look, reflect on what it is that you could do. Um, today uh, is the intent is to spur you on to go back and just think and to be intentional about this and to, to really get out there and see what you can do to turn referrals into enrollment. So thank you so much. And I'll be here throughout the conference if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Mm -hmm.